We are back in our series, When I Met Jesus. Today, it's a bit of a different one because uh, all of the ones we've had so far are when people encountered Jesus or people met Jesus. Today, it's not a person that is meeting Jesus. Let me read it for you from Mark 4 and then we'll pray and we'll get into it. This is Mark 4. On that day, so Jesus had been doing a heap of ministry on that day, uh, preaching, preaching, healing, delivering, uh, displaying. It was, it was getting late into the day. On that day when evening had come, he told them, that's his disciples, let's cross over the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along since he was in the boat. <clears throat> and other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern sleeping on the cushion down the back. So they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. So this is when the storm met Jesus. Let's pray and see what God would have for us today. Father, again, we are coming to your scriptures and we need your help. Thank you that you speak to us still through your inspired word. Father, there's a a lot going on in our our world today, uh, as always. But in particular today, we want to ask Uh, for peace where there is strife and conflict. I want to ask for your people who are suffering around the world in various parts uh, really horrifically, um, people who belong to you and love you. Thinking about, in particular, some of those people in uh, Africa at the moment, Christians who are being targeted, persecuted and even killed. I think particularly in those um, places where war is happening in Ukraine and Israel and Gaza. Father, my request, our request is that you would have your way. Make yourself known. Help us. Father, we're so thankful that you have, um, you saved us from the, from the penalty of our sin. Father, we are really looking forward to the day when Jesus returns and even the presence of sin and its effects are gone, are dealt with. And so, Father, would you speed that day? Help us to have understanding. Uh, Help us to have open hearts and minds to your Holy Spirit as we explore your scriptures today. We want to see a better, clearer picture of who you are, your character, your majesty, your goodness and your kindness towards us in Jesus, the presence and the intimacy of your Holy Spirit. And so help us in every way to grow up into the likeness of Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, So this this passage is actually awesome. Um, I I was uh, looking back to see in 20 years how I've covered this passage before. Never preached it before, unbelievably. Such a famous part of Scripture. Uh, it really highlights the supremacy of Jesus and it also, from the very beginning, highlights the humanity of Jesus. So we see both, both of those aspects of Jesus, both of these natures of Christ in the one little passage here. Right from the very beginning, Jesus has been working hard all day and he's really tired. Like he's, he is he's spent. <clears throat> and so after a long day ministering to many, um, this story starts with the emphasis on Jesus' humanity. He is, he became like us. He is the Word of God who became flesh and dwelt among us. It wasn't just an act, it wasn't just a show, <clears throat> it wasn't something that he just wore for a little bit, it wasn't pretend, it wasn't walking around just looking like us. He actually became like us, he became one of us. He relates to us, Jesus the God-man, 
as a human. Doesn't diminish his, his godness at all. But right from the very beginning, we see he's been working really hard and he grew really weary. How tired was he? As water is coming over the boat, he's sleeping on a cushion. He was really, really tired. Scripture talks about Jesus being able to relate to us in, in, in every way. Had to eat, had to sleep, had to deal with difficult people, had to deal with people he loved dying. Jesus knows what it's like to be human. He is not a distant, far-off God. He is the, the close one. And so he and the disciples, a bunch of other boats, get into the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> They're starting to cross over out of nowhere. Storm comes up. Uh, wind and waves crashing over the side. This must have been a significantly, like a fierce storm because many of his disciples had been fishermen. They were used to being out all night. Uh, we've heard stories in Scripture about them being out all night, not catching any fish. That Fishermen in these days, it wasn't like fishermen in our day where maybe, uh, I don't mean fishermen, professional fishermen, but you go fishing, you don't catch a fish, you can go to the shop and get some more fish. For Jesus' disciples, before he made them fisher, fishers of men, they don't catch fish, they don't eat, and their families don't eat. The disciples think they're going to die, such a severe storm. The disciples are like, we're done for. What can we do? The water's already coming into the boat, can't fight the wind. We're in the middle of the sea. We are doomed. And because Jesus is so tired, somehow he is, he's still asleep. So what do the disciples do? They rouse Jesus. They go to Jesus. What can we do? I mean, what do they expect him to do? Genuinely. You contrast the disciples at the beginning of the story to the end of the story. It's a short story. At the end of the story, they are terrified because Jesus helps them. But at the beginning of the story, they go to Jesus for help. So they're like, we, what can we do? I don't think they go to Jesus full of faith. I don't think they're like, Jesus is the only one that can save us. I think they're just kind of scrambling, right? They're like, we are done for. There's nothing else we can do. Who's not doing something? Jesus is sleeping. How are you possibly sleeping? Don't you care that we're going to die? Like, man, the rigging or do something. I don't think they're expecting him to stand up and speak to creation. They're freaking out. Definitely not full of faith in a moment. Jesus is going to blast them for the lack of faith. See, these are not faith-filled disciples in a time of crisis running to the only one who can help because they are confident in Him. They trust in His ability and His majesty and His authority over creation. They're just scared, scrambling for anything. Likely they've done everything they know how to do as experienced fishermen. And then they're at the end. So like, we're at the end of what we can do. Maybe let's go see what Jesus can do. It turns out, as we know, Jesus is the only one who had authority to help them. What does he do? He, this, this is, I mean, apart from miracles, apart from Jesus being the God-man, this is unbelievable, right? Literally unbelievable, apart from him being the God-man. He stands on the boat, water coming in, waves crashing over, wind howling. And he rebukes the wind. To rebuke someone is to, is to censure someone, is to tell them off, is to kind of have a go. It's a strong disapproval, is a rebuke. And so he stands up and gives the wind his strong disapproval. Maybe like you would a, maybe like you would a child, where you're disciplining a child. He's saying, don't do that. That's not how we do this. That's the kind of picture I'm, I'm seeing here as, I, as I'm reading this rebuke. It's a, strong, it's a telling off. And he te Jesus tells off the wind. Who can do that? Who thinks to do that? The person who's in charge of the wind. The person who's the boss of the storm. It's the person who can tell the storm, not now. Not now. He tells the sea to be silent. So it's not now wind. See, calm down. This must have been, I mean, no wonder the disciples are terrified at the end. That's what the, that's what the scriptures say. They were terrified of the power of this man. 
He tells the sea to be silent and still, and the wind and the waves obey his voice. The disciples are afraid of the storm. It's like, we're going to die. We're afraid. They are terrified of Jesus. They're confronted with something of enormous power. They're confronted with something that in, in the light of, or in the midst of it, because they're surrounded by it, in the midst of this storm, they, are, they appear as tiny and as squishy and as vulnerable as they truly are as human beings. So in light of the storm, they're afraid. In light of the storm, they realise we, can, we can't do anything. We are, to, we are totally at the mercy of the storm and they're afraid and then they see someone or something greater than the storm and they are even more afraid of that person, that thing. What just happened, they're thinking? What does this mean? They wondered. Who is this man? What did we, what did we just experience? They went to Jesus in desperation, not in faith and yet Jesus saves them. His might, his majesty, his authority, his power is greater than the thing that basically, if we could kind of anthropomorphize the storm, give it a personality, the storm had the disciples' life in its hands. And yet Jesus supersedes the authority of the storm. How did he do it? There's not some sort of like psychosomatic faith healer where he's just like rev people up into, you know, some, uh, some ecstatic uh, feeling where they don't feel that, like he's not lengthening legs in some kind of like camera angle kind of, this is not a snake oil salesman. This is someone who speaks to creation and creation obeys him. So before, this is unbelievable what happens. But it's also, because it happened, undeniable to say that Jesus has authority over the winds and the waves, unless you just put it down to absolute coincidence that just at the very moment he tells off the wind and says, no, stop, the wind dies down. And just at the very moment, coincidentally, as he tells the sea to be silent, the sea becomes silent. Apart from an I mean, astronomical coincidence, we see Jesus' authority over creation. And we see from Scripture that Jesus has authority over creation because it's His. It actually belongs to Jesus. Creation was made for Him. Creation was made by Him. We see this in Scripture. Let me give you a couple of examples. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos of God. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him was not one thing created that had been created. He made everything, and He made everything for Himself. Or Colossians, He is the image of the invisible God. The God we can't see, we see in Jesus the firstborn over all creation. Not of creation. He is not created. He is the one supreme over creation. For everything was created by Him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on a cross. So again, we see Jesus is the word of God. And by the word of God, everything was made. God creates the universe. Every one of the trillions of stars Billions of galaxies, however many planets, everything. And we zoom down to the, to the atoms and the neutrons and the quarks and he created everything for himself. He spoke it and by his word, everything is sustained. 
He has authority over everything. Psalm 24, the earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants belong to the Lord for He laid its foundations on the seas and established it on the rivers. Hebrews 11, the faith, now faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof is what, of what's not seen. For by this our ancestors were approved by faith We understand that the universe was created by the Word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. So again, Jesus, He is the Logos of God. He is the Word of God. The personified Word of God takes on flesh and dwells among us. The disciples have, n- have no idea who they're dealing with. They see glimpses of it in, in what to them is amazing, miraculous, signs and wonders, healing people, showing his authority over sickness, showing his authority over even death. And when they see him start to show authority over even creation, they're like, wait a second, what are we dealing with? So he takes on humanity, gets tired after a long day of work, does not lose his divinity. In his divine power, he forgives sins. In his divine power, he tells off wind and silences seas. And the disciples are in awe of the implications of creation obeying Jesus. That's why they write later, it was all made by him. Through him, by him, it was all made for him, for his glory, to put his majesty on display. It's one of the reasons I love <clears throat> that the more science has, has taught us about us, you know, back in the day, well, we might have thought, well, the universe revolves around us. But no, really, we are in the Milky Way galaxy, kind of not on the edges, but not in the centre, kind of just in the middle of wherever. But our solar system's not in the middle of Our galaxy even, we're kind of, again, not on the edges, not in the middle. And then even in our solar system, we're not at the centre, the sun is, and we're not kind of out in the edges and afterthought. We're kind of, we're in the middle of the middle of the middle. We have this kind of grandstand view of all of creation. We're not at the centre of creation. The glory of God is the point of creation. So we would have this vantage point where we could look out and go, we, just like the disciples in the middle of the storm, we go, we are... So tiny. Like, like scripture tells us, we're like a breath. We're like, and then we're gone. Or we're like the grass or the flowers of the field. Oh, look, grass. Next day, oh, the grass is gone. Oh, the flower popped up. Oh, the flower's gone. That's what our life is like. And we experience, we live our life on the grandstand of the universe, staring out into things that make us look so tiny and we're learning more and more every day about <clears throat> kind of how small we can look and go deeper and deeper and deeper into like the atom but also further and further and further into space just realise how wonderful how, uh, how magnificent is our creation and just like the disciples going wow we're totally at the behest of the forces of nature And yet he's Jesus, who is greater than all of creation. And they are rightly terrified because it hits them. We've seen seen Jesus act in ways that are magnificent to us, but now he's really starting to like, you know, open the curtain and let us to see where his majesty and his might and his power and his authority really lies. And it is terrifying What does it mean? When we see Jesus' authority over creation, it shows us that the things that we are amazed by, things that we're in awe of, they're easy for God. This is why this passage and this understanding is so important for us as people who belong to God, as people who have our allegiance in Him, given to Him, and our trust and our hope totally anchored in Him, is that we would understand not just His love for us, although we, we desperately need to understand that, but his authority over all of creation. 
helps us to trust him. On another occasion, Jesus' disciples are talking about how hard it is for a rich person to get into heaven. What Jesus tells his disciples. And they come back and say, who, who can do it then? They're, again, they're like, this is impossible. And Jesus says, it's, it is, you're right, it's impossible. For you, there's, nothing is impossible for God. All things are possible for him. And so for us, what we do is we kind of draw a line around what we understand is possible and then we kind of project a little bit further and we go, and so this is what God can do. When in reality, there's no line for God. Actually, I should say, the line for God is just around his character. He only operates in congruence with his character, in line with his holiness, in line with his justice, in line with his love and his mercy, in line with his omniscience, omnipotence. These are not difficult things for him. We draw our line. That's, that's, our, that's only our line. We say, this is, what's, this is what I can do. This is what like a superhuman person could do, like the, the best of the best. This is what God can do out here. And Jesus comes along and he operates out there and the disciples go, wow, yeah, this is amazing. This is what we've seen the prophets of old do. And then he blows that line out of the water. We ask him for tiny things because that is a limit of our faith. We ask in line with, in fact, for many, we only actually ask God for things that are in the circle of things we can do because we fear asking for something and God saying no what that means for us, because we want to do that thing. Or we fear asking for something we can't do and God saying no, and then that challenging us thinking, well, does God love me? Or is God capable of doing these things? And because we don't want the challenge, we don't ever ever ask. So what we do is we just live within this little thing of, this is what we can do. Or we might maybe ask God for things that we know someone can do. So I might not be able to do it myself, but someone can do this. It's reasonable for a human being to be able to do this. Maybe on my best day, I could go and do this. So our our faith will extend out there. But we need to see Jesus for who he is. So we stop asking for little things. But keep us comfortable, but don't bring God glory. We see the glory of God displayed here. We honour the greatness of God when we ask him for great things. We see more and more of the power and the authority of God. We start to ask into his riches, not to the limit of our understanding. Does this make sense? That's why we need to have a bigger picture of the grandeur and the greatness of God. Just like the disciples couldn't help but to see the grandeur of the storm that they are around, we need to do the work of likewise sitting at the feet of the grandeur of God. To see his greatness. Otherwise, again, we'll just, we'll ask for things that are the limit of our ability to do things or the limit of our, our thinking of God's, you know, what is God's desire to do this for me? or again, his ability to do things for me. Uh, It all comes from a misunderstanding or a very small view of the greatness of God or the authority of God, which is why we need to be in the Scriptures, seeing these things of the ultimate authority of God, well beyond our ability to affect. That's where our prayers need to reside. I can't do it. The disciples actually do the right thing. They go to Jesus. They don't do it because of faith. They do it because of fear. But they actually, they do the right thing. They go to him and he has the authority and the power. We, we want to go to Jesus because of faith. Not, not just because of fear, although sometimes fear will, you know, a, a circumstance will also go, uh, make us think, who can help us? Jesus can help us. What's frightening for us, like being in the storm, waves crashing over our boat, spilling into a boat, wind, that we can't, we can't steer the boat, all those kinds of things, um, you know, wind tossing about, all those kinds of things, none of that frightens Jesus. None of that frightens Jesus at all. Yes, he was tired, but he's also sleeping because he's not afraid. His authority over it. So for us, we need a better understanding of the reality of the greatness of God so that we would stand in awe of him. 
And in light of his awesomeness, no other awesome thing would be fear-inducing, even death. Does this make sense? So the disciples are in a boat. They know boats. They trust boats. Boats are in their, you know, in their wheelhouse, if you like. They know boats. They trust in the boats. But then something greater than the boat comes and they don't trust the boat. Like the boat is not going to save me because something more magnificent than the boat is here. And then something more magnificent than the storm comes along and they are saved. For us, let's just cut out all the middleman and go straight to the one who saves. He has the authority. He made it all. See that even the storm is subject to him and know that for the disciples, he is in the boat with them. So again, he's not an abstract God, not a far off deity. Not, he's not just capable. He is capable. He has authority over it all and he is imminent, intimately involved in the lives of his people. He loves them. He cares for them. He bears with them, even though you can clearly hear he is frustrated with them. Don't ever think that because you, you might be frustrating God. Not that you can frustrate his plans, but Jesus here is clearly going, oh man, I thought, oh, come on, you should be further along by this than now. Uh, further along, yeah, by this now. It doesn't change the fact that he loves them and he's for them and he saves them and is working out everything for their good. Then you see afterwards, when they have the Holy Spirit, they've seen Jesus in, in his authority. Uh, and then later on you see them with this now greater picture of the resurrected Jesus in mind. They don't fear anything. They have moments of fear. So Peter sometimes, you know, he fears people, what they think of me. Uh, sometimes they feel well, we can't, what, if we go there, things are gonna, bad things are going to happen. But their foundation is fearlessness. Where they say, well, we don't even fear death anymore because Jesus has authority over all of creation and even over my life. I said, so this is the same kind of trust we can have in Jesus if we have an accurate picture of the reality of the greatness of God. We don't go to Jesus as a last resort. We've done everything on our own, in our own strength. When you know who he is, when you know what he can do, he is the first port of call. He's the first one to go to. He loves you. He is for you. He is with you. And he is absolutely capable of doing anything he wants to do so we can trust him. That's the story of when Jesus met the storm. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you again for your goodness and your kindness to us in Jesus. My single request today is we'd see you more and more as you are. More and more in your glory more and more in your grandeur, your majesty, more and more in your authority. Help us, Father. Help us see you as uh, King and Lord over everything, over every storm we're going through. Uh, the real storms, the figurative storms, to know that Jesus is with us always in our boat, in the storm, but also the Lord over the storm. Lord, we don't want to be afraid of, again, those storms, um, but help us to be in awe of your majesty, of your ability, and of your loving kindness towards us. In Jesus' name we ask, amen.